Welcome back to Misunderstood. Okay, today, you guys, we have a good one. It's an exclusive. This guy has not spoken publicly since his hit Bravo show, Shaws of Sunset, was canceled. Today, we hear from Mike Shuhead. He's open. He's honest. He gives us the behind the scenes on the show cancellation, what it was like to be on the show, what happened with his run-in with the law, his love life, what he's doing now. He also discusses if he believes in this reality reckoning, if he's Team Bethany or Team Bravo. It was was so interesting to have this hour with Mike and I'm so excited to bring it to you. So sit back, let me know your thoughts. You are not going to be disappointed. Get ready for Mike Shuhead from Shaws of Sunset. Mikey. I'm so happy that you're here. It's such an honor and a pleasure. Welcome to Misunderstood. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So I really want to know from the beginning, how did Shaws of Sunset come to pass? Like how, how did it get approached? How did you get approached and, and why did you do it? Um, so I was living in Las Vegas um, and I spent all my 20s in Vegas. So from the time I was about 21, I dropped out of law school, moved to Vegas to pursue a career in real estate. Market was booming, was making great money. Market crashed. And I came back home with my tail between my legs, like thinking, okay, what the hell am I going to do with my life now? You know, like re the real estate market's dead. Uh, but I had saved up just enough money where I could survive, but I wasn't thriving. Um, and I convinced my middle brother, who was a dentist, to move in with me. Um, and I found us a house in the Hollywood Hills because I wasn't going to move back with my parents. Right. So I have a house in the Hollywood Hills. I'm driving home one day and on the side of the road is this guy, Sammy, big Sam from season one of Shaws of Sunset standing on the side of the road. And I've known this guy for years. You know, we parted together, you know, got nuts, girls, all this type of shit. He's a really fun guy. Um, but one thing I knew about Sammy was that he talks a lot. So if you were going to speak with him, it's going to be an hour conversation because he has so much to say all the time. So I saw him and I thought he didn't see me because I zipped by and he starts yelling my name, Mike, Mike, I'm like, uh, I was going to ignore him. Then he calls me. He's like, come back. I need to talk to you. And I drive back down and he's like, Hey man, we're filming this new reality show. They don't have a name for it yet, but it's about Persians in LA and you'd be perfect for it. And I'm like, Oh, hell no. I heard about this. So-and-so is going to be on it. I want nothing to do with it. I want to be anonymous. He took it upon himself to give the producers my phone number anyways. So uh, this kid, Jesse, who was the creator of the show, who worked for Ryan Seacrest, kept bugging me, called me about 15 times. And every time I said to him, I don't want to do it. And then finally, Ryan Seacrest reaches out to me and says, hey, Mike, I heard you're a stud and you're good looking and he's charming me. And I'm like, Oh, wow, this is Ryan Seacrest telling me all these things. I just came back from a very fulfilled career where I'd lost everything. And this guy's complimenting me. He kind of like baited me. And I was like, all right, I'll sit down with you. And we sat down and he talked to me about the Kardashians and all this other shit that was happening. And I was like, all right, this is, wow, this is, this is my second wind of life. This is where my opportunity is going to come from. Your second act. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's give it a shot. And... Before I know it, I'm in some house in Studio City in a backyard with a bunch of people, um, some who I had known but not really close with, and a lot of strangers, all Iranian, and um, they just interviewed me, and we created this little sizzle that they wanted to show the producers of the show to see if we're right for the, this, this, this new show that they're going to be producing. So the people that they picked for the sizzle reel, was that the people that ended up being on the actual show? Yeah. So it started with like, man, there was like 20 people there that night. Um, and then from that 20, you know, after we were done, we left, then they brought us back together and it was a dwindled down group of people. And then it got dwindled down more. And then we filmed the show 
And then once we filmed the show, they give us six episodes. From the six episodes, they picked um, who was on the first season of the show. And what was your relationship like with the people that were the core OGs of Shaws of Sunset? So Reza is, he just turned 50 in August, okay? Mm -hmm. I am 44, mm -hmm. right? So if people put two and two together, they realize that we were not in school together, right? It's impossible, but we, you know, the Iranian community is small, so we knew of each other, mm -hmm. right? But I was not close with any of these people, except for Gigi. I grew up with her. She was like my little sister. I was best friends with her sister, Layla. And the rest of us, we just, we were acquaintances. Right. Um, but when you start filming a show like we did, where the premise is, hey, you guys are really, really close, we kind of got the idea, like, if we don't give the network what they want, the show's not going to work, because they kept embedding that into our brains. Hey, these checks don't come cheap. You guys mm -hmm. have to listen to us. We know what we're doing. Just follow what we're telling you, and, it's a pa and we're going to lead you to the path for success. So obviously, after spending hours and hours and hours and hours together weekly, as we filmed the show, we got close, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So there was it was it was like uh, like high school, you know. You create little clicks, and then within those clicks, there's other clicks, and you know, we we became close because it was like, wow, look what we're doing for the culture. We are creating a show about Iranians. Where once upon a time, growing up, I would hide that I was Persian. Mm. Right. I'll tell people, no, I'm Mexican. I'm Italian. If I met a girl, I was like, yeah, I'm Italian. They're like, your last name is Shohead. Like, what is, no, it's Shohead. You know, I'd make up shit just to like pretend to play the role because being Iranian wasn't cool. Mm. And when we started filming, the production crew was so excited. Like, dude, your culture is amazing. The food, the music, the, 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 the culture. So I was like, wow, you like, it gave me a new perspective on what people thought. So I became yeah. proud of the show. So I wanted to create something that the world would find to be interesting and creative, but also full of drama and sexiness and all this other shit so that we create something that will survive in this world of television where you have so many different, um, so many different um, options. I wanted people to watch our show. Yeah, of course. And we play so, ball. So how... When you guys weren't filming, how often were you actually choosing to spend time with each other? I mean, I've done a couple reality shows in the past, and I found that when I'm on a show, I get so immersed with the people I'm with. I, after three weeks, you feel like they're family. Like, I was spending all my time with them even when we weren't shooting. Is that what happened with you guys? So, yeah, I'm trying to take, my back to see, I'm trying to take myself back to season one because, yeah. you know, after, after 10 years of, of all the shit I've been through with them, Mm -hmm. I'm a little jaded, but in the beginning, it was incredible. Like, Reza was like my big bro, you know? Um, him being gay, being Iranian, being Jewish, and half Muslim. So he just, he understood so many facets of life because he had dealt with so much that I had this respect for him because he was out, he was proud, he was successful, he was flamboyant, he dressed well. So, like, I became super, super tight with him. And I remember, like, in the beginning... Um, they gave us, you know, it was a, a part of a group chat. So all of us were texting each other. And MJ, before she met me, would like, she'd call me like, hey, Mike, with like her little sexy voice and like flirting with me and like wanting to like, you know, like kind of, we were flirting with each other like we were going to hook up, you know, it was weird. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, me and Gigi, obviously, she, we, we had our, 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 our relationship and we we're friends. And I, I knew her since she was a little girl. Um, and obviously me and Sammy, you know, he, he would make fun of me. He's like, you see, and you didn't want to be a part of the show. And now look, you're going to get so many girls and you're going to make money. And, you know, he always had his chip on his shoulder about that. And we would joke about that. But we all became very close because, like I said, we were filming for 10, 15, 20 hours sometimes a day, mm -hmm. weeks on end, Wednesday through Sunday, every week for months. So mm -hmm. you became close to these people because... You spend the majority of your time with them. I spent more time with them than I did with my own family. And really like brothers and sisters. Yeah. And like during this time, did you decide to keep your day job? Or are you trying to establish who you were as a real person in LA once you were there? Or you kind of let that go and just did the show? No. Nah, I mean, the first season we made like, I think like three, 
like 3000 an episode or something, you know, mm-hmm. you know, like nothing. Um, mm-hmm. so if I was just going to live off that, um, I'd be like poverish, you know? So yeah. I was still working, selling real estate, hustling, doing what I could. And at the same time, you know, uh, being a rock star by, by midweek till the, till the weekend, because it was like no sleep, drinking, drama, you know, creating great storylines, you know, based on, you know, I don't want to say it was lies or lives on the show, but no one's life is really that exciting all the time. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not I don't know anyone that's always doing something. And yeah. they had us going on excursions and hanging out and dinners and staying up all night and then going back to filming the early in the morning. So I was trying to balance both lives, but yeah, it was, it was hard, but no, I definitely had to do more in order to survive, especially in LA living in a house in Hollywood Hills. Um, it's not cheap. And at the beginning, was it helping your career that all of a sudden the show was taking off and everyone knew your name and knew your face? Was that helpful for real estate? Yeah, it was actually. It was it 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 it, it helped with recognition, right? But the way they portrayed me season one was, you know, Mike lost it all and he's the underdog and he's coming back. Um, which I guess was truth, but then like people I don't, it, they made some of the people on the show look more opulent and, and, and like they had more money. Mm-hmm. And those people, some of them really knew how to play into that. And I was just like, yo, I'm just me. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I had it, I lost it, but I'm making it again, but I didn't lose everything. So it's like, I didn't understand it because I didn't watch any reality TV. And my, my crew of friends that were on the show with me would be like, you don't understand how this reality show thing works. You're not doing it right. What do you think that meant? Um, <laughs> they wanted me to be a student of reality TV. So you have mm-hmm. to know how to bring the drama, when to turn it up, when to turn it down. And with me, I'm a Libra. I'm, I'm typically very calm. I like to be even keel. I like harmony. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would always get reprimanded when, when the cameras were off, like, hey, man, you're not being dramatic enough. Right. Stop right. the act. I'm like, what act? You don't even know me. Like, we, we became friends, real close friends, just recently. You don't know who I am. I'm not a confrontational human being. Um, so then I started to realize because I kept getting told, if you don't bring the drama, you're not going to make it. Right. You're only as good as the camera time you get. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get it. That's true. So some, in some ways. Um, so, I mean, I have so many questions surrounding that though, like, because I, you know, in preparation for seeing you, I, I looked at a lot of clips over the arc of all the seasons and how you were, how you were portrayed, um, how, you know, by the way, you know, I really noticed that everyone has their moments of anger, a lot of moments of, anger and passion. There's a lot of that going on throughout all the seasons with different people. Right. And, um, a lot of it has to do with friendships that, you know, people seem really upset that their friendships, um, are being betrayed and, um, that the trust is being betrayed. The, the boundaries are being betrayed. And for you, what I saw is that a lot of times you were the peacemaker, um, for, you know, at least the beginning of it, you really struck me as the person that would get involved to try and calm everyone down. So as we get to sort of the end of the show, um, you know, to have you be the one that got into trouble legally seemed, you know, interesting, shocking. I don't know what the word would be to me because, um, I didn't see that in, in you. Do you know what I mean? Like anyone else you would bring up, I'd be like, yeah, I get it. But I didn't know that I saw that in you, even though, um, you were portrayed in a number of different ways. And we'll get to to that in a minute, but I guess what I want to talk to you about is how do you feel like the show portrayed you and in what ways do you think you fed into that and in what ways you tried to really give your own narrative? This blew my mind when I found out, but did you know that over 80% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about? Seriously, think of how many free trials you subscribe to that you've probably never canceled. That's why I'm such a big fan of Rocket Money. So for me, I signed up. It took less than three minutes. I put my information in and outspouted all this stuff that I had no idea about. I had no idea that in the course of a year, I actually, and you guys, this is a true story, spent over $6,000 on subscriptions. It gave me a full list. It told me all the things that I was spending it on. And I 
could tell from there what I wanted to get rid of, what I didn't know existed. And then the cool thing is they help you cancel these subscriptions. Not only that, I could see how much I was spending in different categories, health and wellness, uh, food and beverages. I was surprised to see how much my daughter, Wyatt Lily, was spending at Starbucks every month. It's a huge amount. So I'm going to be having a conversation with her about that. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the subscriptions you don't want with just the press of a button. No more long hold times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money does all the work for you. And I can tell you, I've personally done this myself. It was super easy and I'm already saving money. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash understood. That's rocketmoney.com slash understood. Rocketmoney.com slash understood. Um, so in the beginning, they allowed me to, you know, because they're trying to fill us out, right? And um, they invested in us. So they knew that they could, in ways, um, manipulate us to do what they want because once the money started to get good and you wanted that money to keep rolling in mm -hmm. all of a sudden the producer who was smiling and pulling you aside and talking to you their words became more like bible you know like man i gotta listen to this person oh this person has a pedigree where they did x y and z show mm -hmm. and they took those shows into huge franchises that person obviously wants the best for our show. I should listen to them. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I started to lose sight of who I really was because A, I was listening to them. The cast of the show started to self-produce and create more drama. So mm -hmm. I started to see them for who they really were. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just started to create animosity between me and them. In the right. beginning, I really wanted everyone to be peaceful and have fun. And I was like, what the, what are you guys doing? You know, this is, this is crazy. Um, and I didn't want our show to be like that. Like I told you, I, was, I wanted, I wanted to represent our culture. Mm -hmm. And after season one, everyone would be like, yo man, you're the, you know, you're my favorite on the show. You're the only one that I watch that actually is normal. And I was like, no man, the rest of them are normal. They just, you know, they just act up for the show because I wanted to protect them. Mm -hmm. Right. And they really weren't as crazy as they were coming across on the show. But um, as time progresses and these people who you become close with, like families, start to betray you and attack you and attack your character and do things behind your back to create drama, um, you start to get bitter with them. And then mm -hmm. you're forced to still hang out with them and grieve your differences in front of a camera. Yeah. Because yeah. if you don't tell your story, they will. And these group of nerd editors that sit in a in an editing bay for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day, like watching you, they're getting notes from the network saying, hey, no, do that scene again, but I want them to look this way. I want mm -hmm. Mike to look this way. I want Gigi to look this way. So like Gigi in the beginning looked like a, a wife, a, a knife wielding insane person. Mm -hmm. Right, And then towards the end, they're like, okay, that's not working anymore. We need to change her up a bit. So she became the Wusa calm mother. Right. I'm, I'm just curious though. Who, who was she in reality? To you? She had those tendencies obviously, but it wasn't like she was always like pulling knives on people. She yeah. also, had to, if you, if you knew Gigi, she was a very sweet, loving, kind person who was very soft on the inside, like a coconut, soft on the inside, just had a hard outer shell because she just didn't want to get hurt. But they exploit, they exploit whatever they want about you. And then God bless our, our fans, they would take whatever they saw as reality. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think like, yeah, maybe he's not that way. And here's the funniest part. I'll meet people, Jim on the street, wherever, Nine out of 10 times, people would be like, man, I really thought you were an asshole. And then I got to talk to you and you're standing here and you spent 15 minutes talking to me and I've expressed all these things that are going on in my life and you've, you, you, you've given me insight, you've given me, you've given me a, like an ear. You're really a nice guy. Mm -hmm. like, 
I don't, I don't know why you got the idea that I'm an asshole, but I get that all the time. And, and then I realized, damn, these, this, this thing, this project that I was part of really did a great job of making me look like something I wasn't. Right. So I want to talk to you about that concept because, you know, a lot of people say, you know, reality TV makes you look like someone you aren't. Um, and they can, you know, edit you to look a certain way, even though you behave a different way. Do you agree with that? Okay. So I want to be fair. I, I, I don't want to be a victim in all of this. Do I have anger in me? Of course I do. Right. It takes a lot for it to come out. Mm -hmm. I don't walk around angry. I walk around smiling. Um, I walk around happy. I'm very optimistic. But, you know, there's times where I get upset, you know, and, and when people spend that much time with you, they know exactly what buttons to push to trigger you, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it wasn't necessarily things they did to me. Like um, one season, you know, uh, Reza went after MJ mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I took that, I took their beef and made it my beef because I didn't like the way Reza was handling that situation. Mm -hmm. No money in the world should make you say certain things about people. Because it'll never go away. And, and I even posted about that today. Be careful what you tell people because it'll play in their minds forever. Yeah. And it just might've been a moment of anger in your life where you said something that you didn't mean, but that person will carry that with them for the rest of their life. So I really come from a place of, I try to come from a place of love and kindness, but you know, there was times that I blew up on the show and they exploited that shit. And, oh, Mike has anger problems and Mike said this and at that. So, yes, they do a good job of of making you look like something you're not because they take something very small and they blow it up and continue to play it and then continue to revert back to it. And, you know, it just keeps playing over and over again throughout the entire season because that one clip, if it got a lot of clicks or a lot of viewers, they're like, OK, that's the one. We got to go play it back. And Throughout the season, they keep editing. So the show is not formatted and then it comes out. It's formatted and then they they make tweaks. Right. And, and that's important to, for people to realize. There is a narrative that is created. So you may have some anger in you, which, by the way, a lot of people do. Uh, they're passionate, right, about certain things. Or, and we're passionate people. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. In certain situations. and But they may leave out the part where you're rescuing dogs on the street and you're helping women, old women cross the road or whatever it is. They may just you know, create this narrative that fits for your character. Also, you had some issues with being loyal with the women you are with, right? So of course they, um, you know, that is your issue, right? That you're dealing with. But I think that um, in a reality show, they put the spotlight on stuff like that. And if it's something that's a pattern, you really get stuck with those um, stigmas because those are the things that people, it stands out with people as opposed to the arc of someone. And, you know, as a person, when you meet someone in real life and you get to know them, you see the entire gamut of who that person is. You see everything, but just in a reality show, you just see little snippets and that's what creates a narrative. And I think that can be what's really dangerous because then people think they know you based on the smoke and mirrors of what is a narrow vision of reality TV. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better, you know, and, and I did have infidelity issues. You know, I, uh, um, you know, I went through two real relationships on the show, my ex-wife who we had, we cared about each other. We loved each other, but we weren't in love with each other. And we, um, got married, even though we knew we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And we try to make it work because to keep face for people and, um, when you're not in a happy relationship, people do things. She did things that I didn't air out because I try to protect her. Now, looking back, I should have brought it up. I didn't. Um, but she did a great job of showing the world, you know, where she ended up and what she ended up doing. And, you know, um, uh, my, my laundry was aired out on the show. Hers wasn't. Um, she's an amazing person. We're, we're, we're friends to this day. And, um, Thank God, both of our paths ended up in a happy place. She's happy. She's moved on. And she's doing her thing. And then with Paulina, that was just, you know, again, so stupid. I feel horrible about it. A lapse in judgment where 
for one day in the middle of COVID, um, having text conversations with someone who I'd never met, who I met on Instagram, who started off by like, hey, your story really resonated with me. I'm going through a divorce. Can I please ask your opinion? And she was a pretty girl and I was like, you know, okay. And then it went from that to baiting me and talking about stuff. And then by the end of the day, just 12 hours of talking, you know, throughout those 12 hours, um, I was like, whoa, what am I doing? I'm gonna get myself in trouble. And I did, it was just stupid. And it got blown out of proportion. And, um, you know, hindsight is 2020. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when you're in the fame and you have these beautiful women who want your attention and you're trying to be good, the devil in me got the best of me and I fucked up. And um, I feel guilty about it to this day. And I realized that I hurt Paulina. I hurt myself. I hurt our families. I wish I can go back in time and fix it. Um, but I realized that, and I'll tell you the truth and be very transparent with you. I did not like myself while I was on the show. I became a human being that resented the show, resented the cast. I resented myself. I hated Ryan Seacrest. I hated Bravo. It was just, I, when they were like, we're coming back for another season, it was like, oh man, I had anxiety because I was like, fuck, I have to film with these people again for another three, four months. What are they going to bring up? How are they going to try to destroy my life this season? How am I going to have to retaliate? And then... Okay, I got to get a new car. Okay, I got to get a new place. I got to get new clothes. It was just, it was this thing that I truly did not like anymore. And mm -hmm. if you if you look at me now, like I weigh 190 pounds, I'm fit, I'm more ripped than I've ever been. Mentally, I'm more strong than I've ever been. I read, I journal, I pray. I go to temple, I'm happy, I love myself. And when I was filming, I was fat, miserable. I ate like shit. I didn't work out. I didn't take care of myself. It was just, I was just miserable. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, Pauline would tell me when you were sleeping, I would, I would twitch because I was so nervous because I just, my anxiety was through the roof because I got to a point where this project that I really loved and was so fun became a nuisance in my life. So for the past several seasons, it's been like that. Right. When the show ended, and I'm sorry to cut to it, but like when the show ended, I was so happy. I was laughing with the producers on the phone. I was like, thank God. They're like, Mike, did you hear what we just told you? Like, the show has been canceled. I was like, yes, thank you. They go, mm -hmm. and, and the producers are, well, one producer, she's, um, she's like, wow, you're taking this a lot better than the rest of them did. Some of them mm -hmm. actually cried. Like, yeah. I, this was a life. I wasn't my life. This was not, this was just a project. And mm -hmm. I was ready. I was checked out years ago. Right. So I want to talk about that for a second, because there are a lot of rumors that uh, Shaws of Sunset ended because of what happened with you outside of the show with Paulina and you getting arrested. Do you want to talk on that subject? Sure. Absolutely. I wish I, I wish I was more. Um, I wish I was more prepared because I would have pulled up the email and shown you. Mm -hmm. Um. When they called, actually, they, they emailed us. And here's what was happening. So they were casting new people for the show uh, prior to season 10. And we thought season 10 was going to be our last season. We're all, you know, talking about it. And what are we going to do? It's got to be the biggest season. And, you know, like, we're all plotting and planning and, you know, all that shit. And mm -hmm. um, they would keep giving us updates. Okay, we're going to do, we're doing a casting call. And, you know, be prepared for this day. And they would they would send us emails telling us to prepare for whatever the, the new season. And, you know, all the ducks have to be in a row for the season to go off without a hitch. We have to, you know, if, if you're renting, you have to get your landlord to say it's okay to film there. They want to get locations. They want to get releases from all of our family members and all that stuff. So we were preparing for this next season. And then there was a huge lull where they didn't reach out to us for like a few months. And, um, I remember Reza was very anxious because he's like, man, I don't think we're coming back. They're just going to drop us like that. This is crazy. And lo and behold, one day we get the call. Hey, we need to do a Zoom call with the entire cast. And we're like, all right, cool. This is it. Like, okay, fuck, we're coming back for another season. And um, in, the, in the email that they sent out, there was 
four names. Actually, let me see. Hold on. It was Reza, MJ, Gigi on one call. Okay, one Zoom call. And then Mike, Nima, Destiny, Shervin on another call. Okay? So basically what they did was they were going to give MJ, Gigi, and Reza a spinoff. Kind of like Three's Company vibe where he's the, he's the godfather of their two children and they're going to do a spinoff. And the rest of us were getting clipped from the show. Okay? Which was my thought. Because I was like, why would they split it up? This is not, this is not normal. So mm -hmm. I had a feeling. And, you know, they called and that was it. They're like, hey. Mike, we're sorry to break the news to you guys, but you know the show's ending. It's just getting way too expensive to film. You guys, you, the 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 show is unionized, and you know Ryan has to get his cut, and you guys are demanding too much money, and it just doesn't make sense for us. And sorry, at that point, was it how were the ratings? I mean, was it still doing well, or was it really falling off? Yeah, ratings were great, but okay. understand, uh, cable television is a dinosaur now, right? Mm -hmm. You have Netflix and um, Hulu and all these other streaming networks where you could watch anything you want at any given time. And then finally, these morons at Bravo were like, oh, shit, Netflix is at 100 million, a billion, whatever they're at. Maybe we should do something like that. And then they finally rolled out Peacock. But then, dude, you're like, you're late to the, you're late to the party, dude. Like, it's already happened. People already have their subscriptions. And now you guys want to do Peacock? Mm -hmm. So... They just missed the boat and they realized um, and if you if you watch this, these new shows that Bravo's come out with, the formula that we created as a group of, of Iranians and with um, with Ryan and his production team, they just rinse and repeated what we did with like harm, that karma show. Right. Mm -hmm. And like other shows that they created, some flop, some don't. And it's cheap for them because it goes back to paying their talent 3000 an episode instead of 50000 an episode. Right. I'd rather take a chance on a $3,000 show, and if it flops, whatever, and if it does great, great. We have that for a few seasons until they get too big, then we'll clip them, and then we'll do the next show. And that's mm -hmm. why you're seeing like shows like Million Dollar Listing New York that is really not expensive to make mm -hmm. because they're filming at people's properties. They're not really doing anything. They're just following them around. But the shows get clipped because these guys are like, well, you guys are making money off the show. We want more money. And it just doesn't make sense for them financially. So they, they clip the show. And that's what happened with us. Okay. So you, you four got the call saying it was over. What was the call for the other three? That they were going to get a spinoff, like I told you. Yeah. And then they started filming. And well, they did. They got that far with filming. They, they filmed a sizzle or did some some stuff, and I was so happy for them. And they called me like, I'm sorry, Mike. Like, we wanted you to be a part of this. No. I remember MJ called me, and she was so upset. Mm -hmm. And Reza, too, actually. Reza was, he was like, dude, I really tried. I was like, no, man, I don't want to do it. I'm good. I'm good. I want to get and, back to my normal life. And where was your relationship with the cast, the seven of you, I guess. So the other six, um, at this point, like how were you feeling about all of them and how were your friendships? I will always love them, right? Because they were like my brothers and my sisters and I truly, truly, truly care about them. Mm -hmm. But it got to a point where we didn't like each other. We were fighting over dumb shit mm -hmm. because I could not say, well, I guess we're just filming a show. I'll just forgive and forget you, you know? No, you said some really disgusting stuff about my mom, my dad, my brothers, my my, my fiance at the time. You threatened me. Like, I, I can't just forgive that. I don't care if there was a camera on. At your core, it allowed you to say those things to me. Mm -hmm. I said mm -hmm. horrible things back to you. Yeah. And I don't want you to forgive me because we're not friends, obviously, if you would do that to me. Right, and that stuff became real, it seems. Like, the the words, the anger... Um, and what was interesting to me is that it almost seemed like they resented or Gigi or whoever resented when a new woman would come in your life. When Paulina came into your life, it was almost like you had to choose between them and her. Uh, and that seemed to cause a big rift. Um, and who do you, you know, when you're in the middle like that, that's so hard. They honestly hated Jessica when I, when I was dating her mm -hmm. uh, and that poor girl. 
put up with so much. Mm -hmm. They would, I would get spoof text messages. They would spoof text message her like, Hey, I was with your man last night and you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm dating your man. And she's like, you know, and, and I'm like, but I was with you, babe, last night. Like we were having dinner together. And she's like, I know, but who are these people? Just, just, I don't know if it was her or the, or the world, because, you know, as a real estate agent, my number's out in the world. Right. Mm. And it's, and, and, you know, we're, there's two degrees of separation. Like, Hey, do you know, Mike, do you have his phone number? Can I get it? You know, or do you know, Jessica, can I get her phone number? And it just started to cause this, these issues in our, in our lives. And I remember poor Jessica, I think this was like season three. She's like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I love you. I care about you. This show is going to destroy you and it's going to destroy our relationship. You choose. Do you want to do the show or do you want to be with me? Mm -hmm. And selfishly at the time, I'm like, don't make me choose. Cause this is, this is, this is my career. Like yeah. you know, this is, this is making me money. This is bringing me appearances. This is helping with my real estate. Uh, yeah. And at that point, it's part of your identity. I mean, it's how people associate who you are like it or not. I mean, I love, I became Mike from Shaw's of sunset instead of Mike, Shaw, Mike from Shaw's Mike being Mike on television, mm -hmm. the guy who this image that was created, this heartthrob sex symbol, like they're, they're trying to create. I carried myself that way throughout life after the show was over. Cause I was like, man, if, if I slip, then they're going to think I'm a fraud. So I have to live up to that. Right. Yeah. And I tried that and it's exhausting pretending to be something you're not. Yeah. You know, all the time to be on, you know, and God forbid if I was out and I didn't take a picture with somebody, yeah. oh, Mike's an asshole. So it didn't matter where I was or who I was with. And imagine at the time I'm dating this young girl, she's 10, 11 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I just want to hang out with my man. And we're sitting having dinner. And in the middle of my dinner, I'm, you know, just eating my food. And someone comes up and is like, can I take a picture with you? And I'm, an, I'm having an intimate dinner with my, with my girlfriend at the time. And my mouth half full, I got to get up and take a picture because otherwise you're going to be deemed like an asshole or you're too good for people. So it always had to be on. And it was exhausting because right. then it was causing me to be anxious. Then I, that would ripple into my relationship. Right. And, and also I feel like that creates a lot of jealousy for women. They get jealous of who's talking to you. They get jealous of the temptation that is being thrown at you, whether or not you accept it or not. But also I feel like sometimes that creates a lot of jealousy of like, he's this person and I'm just the side piece, you know, no matter who I am, I will always be Mike's girlfriend and I will never be more than that. And I think that that can, t you know, cause a problem in a relationship. You know, you've dated some, 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 very well-known people, right? And mm -hmm. even though if he, he would tell you, like, you're beautiful, you're mm -hmm. so gorgeous, oh, my God, like, I love you, I, I want to be with you. And regardless of how much he said that, it's it's just human nature to feel insecure if this yeah. person with is always getting attention, mm -hmm. right? Um, as and also because everyone thinks they know you. Right. So right. like everyone thinks they're friends with you or they're enemies with you. Either way, they think they have an intimate connection with you. And for a woman who has an intimate connection with you, I would I personally would think that that is frustrating, intimidating, because then there's no us. Right. Yes. And we don't have something that's sacred. Yes. And unfortunately, with Paulina, I was like. Unhealthy obsession with her. I loved her loved her. Like I would look at her and she was, you know, like a supermodel in my eyes, gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And I loved her and I loved everything about her where I would, you know, I would walk to the end of the earth for her if she wanted me to. Right. Mm -hmm. she, she had my entire heart. I loved her. I loved her children. I loved her family. And I would express that to her. But because of the attention and the, 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 the people sliding to the DMs, it made her insecure. And then when I did what I did, responding, you know, that devastates a person. Of course, yeah. It devastates a person. And I was so miserable in my own mind that I was trying to cure what was ailing my heart and my mind. Even though I was getting all this attention, I still didn't feel attractive because I wasn't happy with who I was.
Yeah. You still felt empty to be clear. You didn't, you didn't have a physical, you didn't cheat physically. You were, you had an emotional relationship. Yeah. I'm, I, I just, uh, hmm. I'm so weird. I just like to know. I like that chase. That's sexy for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Even when we were chatting, there was this little bit of flirting that's happening. Right. And it's a cute thing that I just do. I can't help it. I've been this way with my entire life. I do it with, I'll do it with a gay guy. I'll do it with a woman. She could be attractive. She could not be attractive. She could be 80 or, you know, 19. I'm just, that's, that's my defense. That's the way I just, I, A, I feel good. It gives me this, this feeling of satisfaction. Um, Well, and I, I just would like to say for you, I would think that you find it sexier to feel known. You know what I mean? Like, I think you really like feeling like that connection, whereas opposed to like a one night stand. Yeah, maybe that'll feel good for the moment, but I think it feels good to you. And I, I totally get this This is why I recognize it in you. I like when someone really gets to the heart of me for a second, you know, that's what I I like the attention. I like to know that I'm making that person laugh or that person finds me to be attractive. You know, I've had one night stands in my life and without a doubt, I feel like crap the next day. And yeah. now that I've gotten older, um, I've, I've realized that the only person that needs to make myself feel good about me is me. Mm-hmm. So that's why I feel more fulfilled. I'm, I'm, I'm working on my body. I'm working on my, on my health. I'm working on eating right, uh, reading the right books, journaling. I thought that was the softest thing a person could do. Like what you write down your thoughts. What? Are you a woman? You know? And then as I got older, now I'm in my feelings. I cry at movies. I cry at the thought that that me and Pauline are broken up. I cry at the thought that I, I don't get to see her kids who I love. I'll be at the gym working out and I'll start tearing because, um, you know, men are stupid. It, sometimes it takes for us, it takes us longer to become mature. Mm-hmm. This last year, I've, I've really matured in my life. And um, I realized there's a reaction for all my actions. And unfortunately, uh, I'm dealing with the circumstances of what I've done in the past. And I don't look for that validation anymore. You know, I don't need it. So finally, I guess the ramifications of the show have worn off where now I'm just myself, you know, I'll sit and talk to somebody if I want to. And if I don't want to, I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm I don't want to take a picture with you right now. And you could say whatever you want about me. I don't care how you feel. Right. You're going to have to wait until I'm done with my dinner. If you're still here, then we can take a picture. But I'm not going to get up and serve you, serve you and not serve this woman who I'm sitting with who has given her life to me, been there with me, because I was making her feel like she's valueless. And I didn't even realize that until I became someone who has wisdom and understanding of how I'm making people feel by my actions. Okay. So let's talk about Paulina, who you brought up a couple of times. So, okay. We've established you guys all got the call that the show was ending and that was before you got in trouble. Correct. Way before. Do you want me to pull up the email? No, no, I, I believe you. It's your word. So I just wanted to have you establish that because I think, you know, when people listen, when you Google why Shaws of Sunset, ended it says because you got arrested for domestic violence that's what google says right so i want you to clear that up but google also says i'm five two (laughs) google says my net worth is uh, is like a million bucks um i don't know how i became this person and then the rest of the show the those people are worth like 10 million dollars or whatever and whatnot and i just laugh about this shit because the internet is filled with so many lies Mm-hmm. Anyone can post anything they want on the internet. Yeah. And it's up to you whether you want to believe it to be true or false. But the reality is, is that the show was 100% without a shadow of a doubt canceled mm-hmm. way before this incident. Way before this incident. I'm 5'11 and I have more than a million dollars in my net worth. Let that be told. Woo! You know, like, let, you know, let me be. The, the 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 bearer of truth for everybody um but again clickbait let's make shit exciting oh this is a perfect opportunity to uh to 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 use mike's incident that happened and create a reason why the show was canceled 
Okay. So, and now straight from the horse's mouth, let's hear, if you don't mind, what really happened between you and Paulina that night. Um, yeah. The night that changed my life forever, um, it was a Sunday night and me and Paulina um, were home. The kids were home sleeping and uh, she had been smoking hookah in the house in our theater room, right? With the door closed and we had doors that lead to the backyard. So um, she'd like to smoke hookah in there. And the smell of hookah makes me physically ill. I hate it. Um, I didn't want the children to be affected. And again, because I love Paulina so much, I didn't like that she'd smoke hookah. Um, but it was a way for her to relax and she really enjoyed it. And I tried to cope with it and I just couldn't. So we would argue about that all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's been happening for a couple of nights in a row. And that Sunday night, we got into a huge argument. And our home is almost 5,000 square feet. It's a huge two-story house. And um, we had our words with each other. And Paulina's like, get the fuck out of the house. And I'm not getting out. And I'm yelling at her. She's yelling at me. And, you know, things start getting thrown at each other and we're just yelling at each other. But the, the yelling is so loud that it's vibrating the house. So Nanny's at home. She's been with us for years. She gets scared. Police are called. Police come to the house. They want to come in. I'm like, there's absolutely no way I'm letting you in my home. The kids are sleeping. It's going to scare the crap out of them. Nothing is wrong. I'll have Paulina come out. She'll talk to you guys and you guys can go. Mm -hmm. No, we have to come clear the house. He's telling me. I said, dude, I'll bring her out. You could talk to her. Mm -hmm. It's me and her in the house. You're going to scare my kids. If you're walking through your you're two police officers walking through my house, my, it's like 10 30 at night, I'm not going to mm -hmm. let it happen. Next thing I know, he thought that I was, that I was disobeying him. And before I know it, there's 20 police officers now in front of my house. Sergeant comes and says, look, Mike, he knew my name. Hey, Mike. Mm -hmm. I never told him my name. Hey, Mike, step outside. Let me talk to you. So I step outside. One cop grabs me by the arm and is holding me like I'm a hardened criminal, right? And we have a carport. And you can't get out of the carport unless you have a car. It doesn't open. Right. And they knew that because I had to call to physically open the door for them when the other cops came. I had the phone in my hand. So the one cop, the first cop that showed up, goes inside. Little did I know that he knew exactly who I was. So he tells Paulina that night, I know he hit you. I know him because I used to watch him on his show with my ex wife and I never liked him. And I'm outside and I'm not hearing any of this. And then he's talking to Paulina. Paulina starts like bawling, like, you know, please leave him alone. You know, everything's okay. They do the walk through the house. He comes out and goes, cuff him. So they cuff me. And I'm like, why the fuck am I getting arrested? It's like, you punched her. I'm like, dude, I weigh 215 pounds. If I punched this woman, there'd be nothing left of her. Mm -hmm. Right? They take me to jail. Um, no, before they take me to jail, they're like, hey, we know you have guns. Where are they? because all my guns were registered to my name. So I had guns in our bedroom. And at the time, this was a year ago, there was a lot of robberies happening in our area, a lot. Like we're hearing about it on the, on the neighbor app all the time. So I stockpiled on guns and I was like, if anything happens, I'm gonna protect my family, you know? Mm -hmm. I took Paulina to the range, I taught, taught her how to use guns, we would go practice. So she'd be comfortable just in case, God forbid anything happened. As a irresponsible gun owner, I didn't realize that my guns need to be in a safe, right? So I had guns stored around our bedroom. So in case anything pops off, she can get access to the gun quickly. I can get access to the gun quickly and we can protect ourselves. So I had guns in the closet. I had guns in my, uh, in my um, nightstand, but our closet and our bedroom had a lock on it and the kids were never allowed. They knew never to come into the bedroom unless they're with mommy Mikey or the housekeeper. 
Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, they walked out with my arsenal of guns and, you know, the next day, Paulina bails me out because they wouldn't let me out on my own recognizance. They bailed me out. Um, she bailed me out with my brother. They came together. And um, I found out I had 14 charges against me. Now, not one of the charges was a felony, right? And a battery, which domestic violence is, co is considered a battery, is a felony, mm -hmm. right? So when the cop was writing up his report, I guess he wrote it in a way where everything was being charged as, as, a, as a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. And um, I later found out, because I had to get an attorney, that any time the police are called to a domestic violence case, one of the people that are involved in this domestic violence case have to be arrested. And this happened after the O.J. Simpson trial because um, O.J.'s wife and that other poor guy got murdered because wow. they mm -hmm. came, when they came to, to, to arrest O.J., they didn't because of his clout and who mm -hmm. he was. So um, after that incident, the new law is that if, if the police are called on any type of disturbance between cohabitants that someone has to get arrested so they arrested me right and me and paulina we stayed together for nine months after the incident mm -hmm. and when the note when the news broke where the internet found out about the situation you know her family got involved my family got involved her friends my friends and then it just blew up into something that now was another added Stress on your relation. That stress yeah. on her, stress on me. And it just, we decided, hey, why don't we just take a little break? I'll move out and we'll figure it out. And, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And then we, we drifted apart. I got my day in court. The charges were dismissed. All of them? All of them. But what they did was, because the DA didn't like the fact that I had my gun stored improperly, Mm -hmm. It made me do community service, take parenting classes because I was being a bad parent because I had these guns stored irresponsibly and gun classes. Okay. So I had to do these three courses in order for the charges to all be dropped. And just to clarify for me and everyone, so the things that they were following through with were the gun charges, not with the domestic violence or the battery charge? They wanted to they wanted to push this domestic violence thing on me so bad. And Paulina's like, dude, I don't know what we we'd never been in trouble, but there was no hitting. We were arguing with each other. I would never hit her. I would never ever hit a woman. And it's crazy because when the news broke, Jessica reached out to me, my ex-wife. Three of my ex-girlfriends reached out to me. Um Girls I dated from years ago, from when I lived in Vegas, called me and like, dude, I know this is total bullshit. You would never hurt anybody. Anyone who knows me knows I would never do something like that, ever. Especially right. with someone who I'm obsessed with. Like, I was fighting with Paulina so she wouldn't smoke hookah so she wouldn't get sick. Mm -hmm. That's not so to clarify, so to clarify, you may have a temper, but you never hit Paulina. I've never hit a woman ever in my life. I would never, ever, ever do that. That's something that's, in my eyes, heavily frowned upon. And she did not claim you hit her, right? She, she said no, you did no, not. No, no. And then, you know, what well, my biggest mistake was, though, love, that I disappeared from the internet because I was so embarrassed about what happened that yeah. I wanted to hide under a rock. I'm like, oh, my God, the world's going to think I hit her. Yeah. And I was so embarrassed for me First for Paulina, because this poor girl's name is now being pulled through the mud about being this battered woman. And then secondly for me, and then my entire family, her entire family, because now we have the stigma like, oh, he hit her. And the, the internet's cruel. So they talk shit and they, 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 they want to create clickbait. So everyone's picking it up. And it was on every single um, tabloid you could think of. Mm -hmm. The TMC to in touch to us week everywhere. And one made it bigger than the other. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, we actually went to Mexico together a few months after the incident, and some loser piece of shit 
started taking videos and pictures of us. I didn't, unbeknownst to us, we didn't know mm -hmm. on the beach. I thought I was safe. We went to the beach. I'm hanging out with Paulina and her kids who were like my children. I would call them my kids. It was never like, oh, they're your children. Like our kids. Our, our babies, the babies, you know, I, I really truly love them. And I, I still do. And um, I was holding my little girl because the sand was hot and Paulina's walking with her son behind us and someone snapped a picture of us walking. You know, we're putting our head down so like people won't, because I didn't want to attract attention. Mm -hmm. And we're walking. And then the tabloids were like, oh, Mike and Mike and uh, Paulina were on a lavish Mexico trip, but very minimal PDA and all this other nonsense. They fluffed it all up to make it into something it's not. When in reality, the reason why I wasn't walking with Paulina and holding her is because I was holding the baby so she, her feet don't burn. Yeah. Okay. You know, so it's just wild how the internet works and how they want to blow shit up. Yeah. So what is your status with Paulina now you said you guys went your separate ways do you guys speak uh, what, what's going on with you um for 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 months when we separated it was like I love you I miss you you know you're my king no one will ever replace you and uh, you know I'll talk to her the same way and um uh, I sent her flowers for Valentine's Day this last year even though we weren't together and she texted me my heart will always belong to you and um me and her had a really incredible connection. She was just my person. Mm -hmm. you know? um, she'd be thinking something and I would say, she's like, oh my God, I was just thinking that. Or if I was craving some type of food, she wanted to, I was like, Mexican food? She's like, yes. Or, hey, let's go shopping on Melrose. Yes. Or, you know, she'd be like, hey, I just want to stay in tonight. I was like, absolutely, me too. It's like, we just, it was very cohesive. It was just incredible. But these outside sources, like the show created so much difficult, angry energy between us. Mm -hmm. It was like this elephant in the room that um, it just caused unnecessary damage to our relationship. Yeah, right. Okay, so I think we've established that it may have worked had you not been part of a reality show with your relationship involved. Would you ever do another reality show? Unequivocally, yes. It would have for sure lasted if there wasn't a show because I wouldn't have had... well. If hmm. I made mistakes though, so I want to own that. Like I should never have texted that girl. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't have had the temptation. Or the clout that someone would want to jump in my DM and like want to be with me. And I still to this day have never heard from the girl again from that day after she texted Paulina our messages and became the side chick. So I don't know if it was a setup thing or what, but I have my doubts because she reached out to one person on the show out of everyone on the show. She didn't reach out to me or the producer. She reached out to this one person, one of my castmates and was voicing her um, unhappiness about why she made it on the show and why they made her look a certain way and, mm. and all this stuff. So I have my doubts of why uh, this person appeared in my life and who they were, mm. but that's not here nor there. Um, it was an amazing learning experience and it won't happen again because the um, the level of loss that I experienced losing this person who was my person and losing these children who I loved and adored um, definitely was not worth the few minutes of excitement and feeling um, this, these dopamine hits in my head because someone found me attractive and I was having like just these conversations that were just exciting. So yeah. it's a great right. lesson, great lesson, a hard one, an expensive one, a good one. Now that summer is over and my daughter is going back to school, I've always seemed to be running around from one thing to another, but I still make it a priority to eat healthy and Green Chef is my savior. Not only are their meals delicious, but they are the number one meal kit for eating clean. They have nutritionist approved recipes with incredible ingredients, no artificial colors or sweeteners and have limited processed ingredients. The best part is there are over 80 weekly options to choose from, so you will never be bored. There are calorie smart and plant-based options, Mediterranean, protein packed and gluten free with green chef you can satisfy all your cravings and still eat healthy and with their new quick and easy recipes that are 
ready in 25 minutes or less. It's the perfect solution for when I'm busy at work and I can't find the time. With step-by-step recipes, pre-proportioned and prepped ingredients, Green Chef just makes my life so much easier and it's delivered right to your door. It cannot get better than that. So this week I got a big box. It had sort of an Asian flair to it and I made myself for lunch spicy beef and broccoli noodle bowls. It was so good. I had a second one that I made the next day for dinner. I absolutely loved it. The cooking time was 20 minutes. The calories per serving were 700 and it was so good. My daughter loved it enough that she wanted to try cooking. So the next day she made cheesy artichoke chicken sandwiches and also the sesame chimp, sesame shrimp noodle bowls. And let me tell you, she was doing like TikToks and all excited that she was now a chef. And she documented um, the 20 minutes she spent cooking and how good the food was. And she asked me when we were getting our next box. So if that isn't a ringing endorsement, I don't know what is. That people of all ages, from someone who's 11 to me, who's middle-aged, would love eating this food. I'm so excited to get my next box. So for 50% off, you guys, go to greenchef.com slash under Understood 50 and use code understood 50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash understood 50 and use code understood 50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. So Mike, what do you think about the state of reality TV right now? As we all know, you know, there's been a lawsuit, I guess is what they're calling it that um, Bethany is the front person with Mark Garagos and other lawyers um, against NBC and Bravo. Um, What are your thoughts on this whole state of affairs and the reality reckoning that they're talking about? (laughs) Bethany beat me to it. And she's a very, very smart woman. I have a lot of respect for her. Um, She is uh, incredibly intelligent, took this platform and created a monster business around it. Um, And uh, I tip my hat to her and she's someone that I admire. Um, And when you're that big on a reality show, when your name is synonymous with the show, Mm -hmm. you get preferential treatment from the network. You get preferential treatment from the production company. So imagine if she's coming out and saying, they didn't treat us right. We should be unionized. They're taking advantage of us. Mm-hmm. Imagine who, how the, the little guy who just started on a reality show or who was an add-on got treated. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you know, like it, so yes, there's hierarchy and they definitely don't treat us uh, with the respect we deserve. Uh, uh, you know, typically if you're in a hostile environment and you want to leave that hostile environment, typically people let you go. Mm-hmm. But at reality TV, they follow you. You take your microphone on. They, 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 you take your microphone off. I'm done. I'm leaving. Fuck this. They'll follow you all the way to the car to get your reaction and make sure they take that little bit of dignity you still may have left. And they're going to fucking steal that from you. Because mm-hmm. we want to make sure that people, that, that we have good footage that people are going to watch. And they want to see you storm off. Right. Right. They don't talk about what triggered you. They talk about your, your actions. Right. And right. It- and that's such an interesting thing to think about because at some point, you know, again, I've done this not in such a big way that you did, but I know you feel this connection to producers. You there's usually one or two that you get really close to and you feel like they get you or you really like them. And then all of a sudden when you see that they're not stepping in, it's almost, you know, it you feel like you're let down. Do you know? <laughs> Two producers stick out, actually three, three. One of them was Persian, Mm -hmm. um, Persian gay guy that would play up the butchness when he needed to and played up the, hey, bitch, and and that type of shit when he needed to. So he knew exactly how to get what he wanted from you. And then we had another one, also a gay dude, that knew exactly how to, and it doesn't matter their sexuality, it's just, they knew it to be cute and fun and you didn't take it as in a way where it was like she was being aggressive with you. Yeah. And then you knew when to butch it up and fucking reprimand you. And these two guys were two of the most um, manipulative human beings 
I've ever met in my entire life. Mm. Both producers of the show. Um, the 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 unpersian one was the producer for the last few seasons of our show, and he did a phenomenal job. Like he has a triple PhD in in uh, bamboozling and 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 getting people to do what they want. Um, and he got Paulina eating out of the palm of his hands, like like a little rabbit. And he would just be in her ear. Hey, babe, we need you to get on the show. You need to say what you need to say because you know. Mike's doing this and Mike's saying that behind my back. And I was living with Paulina and she wouldn't tell me. I was like, babe, who are you talking to? Right? And he was manipulating her behind the scenes. And that's why she got on the show and was like, yeah, I'm done with Mike. I'm done. No, I'm done, 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 done. And then I'd go home and, you know, she's like, I'm sorry, babe. I shouldn't have done that. I know. I just, and then we'd make up and I couldn't get mad at her because I know because they were doing the same thing to me. And I was a seasoned fucking vet. Mm -hmm. Well, and they also, they almost lure you in of like, well, if you don't go back, I mean, this is your chance to, to give your narrative, to tell your story in your words. But then, you know, you come on there and you get provoked in all sorts of ways and it gets, you know, and then it gets edited later. So it's not really your words, even though, you know, you're saying to an extent what you want to, but it, you, it's, it's like turned on you. <laughs> well, you make a facial gesture, like, or, you know, you, you do like a, an eye roll and they'll take that and put it somewhere where it wasn't even part of that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Or right. what they call wild. We need you to come and do a wild line, mm -hmm. a wild line. Yeah. Uh, just go into a, go into a, 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 a quiet place and say this. Hey, Reza, that was fucked up that you did that. Was that good? No, do it again. There was an echo. Hey, Reza, that was fucked up that you did that. Right. And they'll fucking put it in the show wherever they wanted to, to create that scene, to make it seem like you were fighting with them. Right. Okay. Well, wait, so you do bring up a good point. So you, you get involved in this, like you're an actor kind of, and you're doing these scenes. I'm Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Better looking Brad Pitt. Um, but, but the thing is, is that, you know, what do you think about these allegations where people are saying, well, I was made to drink a lot and behave in ways that I never would. And it was, you know, borderline abusive. And I was doing these things that I was forced to do, but like you're saying, they're asking you to do things to create scenes. Um, you know, what do you say to those critics that will say, but you did all these things on your own. How could you blame other people for your actions? Absolutely. And, and, and um, some of the people on the show would, happily and openly do things that were horrible. They would cut their own mother's throats if, if, if they were asked to because they wanted to keep the show alive. Yeah. And there were certain people that wouldn't, but we could be coerced to because, you know, for instance, this producer I was talking about, um, we'd be filming and we'd be there for a few hours and he's standing there, right? And... He's watching, and it's not playing out the way in his mind it should. Mm -hmm. And I can't even tell you how many times he'd throw off his microphone, he'd throw off his earpiece like this, like, okay, camera's down, camera's down, camera's down. Guys, you know what? Let's just go home. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Guys, take a five. Forget it. You guys don't want to make a good show. Forget it. That's okay. It's okay. Do you think anyone cares about this bullshit? Just like that, I'm like... Uh, what do you mean? Okay, let me remind you, and you just do that, like like a like, like a little just aggressive bitch. Like, let me remind you, okay? Last time we were here, Reza said this about you, and you said this about MJ, and Gigi was in the corner with a knife, and Nima was picking his nose. Do you remember this? No. Well, remember it. I was like, oh shit. Okay. Like, he's not telling me what to say. Yeah. But, but he's serving it to you on a plan. Listen, motherfucker, like, do you want to get out of here or do you want to film until tomorrow morning? Hurry up. And then Reza would get pissed off. He's like, guys, come on. These checks don't come cheap. Let's go. And, you know, he was the, he was the godfather of the show because he was so outrageous and so good. He was always on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I respected about him, that he was always on. And he knew how to carry the show in a way that, was fun and light and he knew when to bring the drama and when to act like an asshole and when to be cool. And so it was like, okay, I get it. Okay. I'll follow your lead. 
Right. And, right. And we just go down this rabbit hole of just insanity. And then imagine filming for eight hours and going home. Mm. You're fucking frazzled. Yeah. You're frazzled. You're like, holy shit. Like I just got into a war and then you have the anxiety of that moment. Then you have the anxiety when you sit down months later and you're doing your confessional mm. because you know now where the show is going to he- head because they're asking questions in particular to a certain situation that you thought would make it on the cutting room floor, hopefully. And then the third time again, when the show comes out, now you have to relive it, but not just between you and your friends who knows why that shit went down, but now the entire world who's watching is and is now blowing up your social, mm-hmm. blowing up your email, crank calling you in the streets, talking to you. So right. it's it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult position to be in. So yeah. I understand why people are upset because in the moment you're drinking, where the alcohol is flowing freely, mm-hmm. right, and they'll keep on bringing it because you'll keep consuming because you want to numb yourself so that you can create what hopefully won't make it, but may, but you'll deal with it later. But you're so induced in alcohol and fear and anxiety and peer pressure that you do shit that you may have not wanted to do. And right. it's time that someone pulls back the, the curtains and says, nah, that's not fair. You can't fucking treat us like that. Yes, we are reality stars. And yes, you guys are paying us well, but damn, you're taking away our dignity. You're taking away our, our true expression, editing something to be what it's not. And then mm-hmm. we're having to cope with it for not just the three times that I said, but for years to come, because now people are being able to watch it on Peacock and YouTube and just, it's going to play forever. Mm-hmm. Right? And then people's perception of you and their, and their thoughts are you're that person, which you're really not. And that to me is like what I think is worth the most money kind of like if your reputation is going to be damaged or there's going to be a stigma that goes with you for years to come because the show is rerun and you cannot get away with that. That to me is what's most damaging. Like if I'm going to look like this and have a scarlet letter on my head for all these years, it better be worth something because I'm not doing that for free. Now that, that leads me to a question for you. If I paid you residuals, would that be worth it? I mean, well, it the pain. I mean, it, it, yes, it eases the pain because that, that's something you signed up for, right? Yeah. At the beginning, you signed up for being on the show. You knew what reality shows are about, but you know, now in hindsight, you look at how it's affected your life, whether or not you're getting the deals you want to get. People are reaching out to you to get those multi-million dollar houses because they know you, they want to be friends with you. Or are they like, this guy's a jerk. This guy, you know, is a cheater. It's affecting your relationships that you can't get married to someone because they think you're always going to cheat on them. I would be like, fuck that. That's worth money to me then. Cause I have to live with this. Yes, um, yes. to me that, I mean, I get it. I get it. It's I think, hard. And I, think, and I think that's completely fair. You know, uh, we should be compensated. Right? Yeah. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. So Bethany came, was on a uh, podcast this morning on her podcast. Um, she said over a hundred reality stars have reached out to her personally um, and to the lawyers. So I want to clarify something because I think there's a lot of rumors on the internet. Um, so there's a, a movement to create a union going forward, but is there also something where all these reality stars are coming out of the woodwork because they're looking to get some sort of back pay or they're looking to have some monetary value come into play for what they've gone through? Like, do you know what this lawsuit will turn into? So uh, from some reliable sources, there is about, a, uh, I think, 100 reality people who have reached out to Mark Yaragos, mm-hmm. who I'm very surprised is taking on a case like this because he deals with very high profile um, people and celebrities and cases. But obviously he sees something here where there's promise that there is a case. Yeah. And, um, you know, if it was one or two people, you could say they were lying. And, uh, and, and, and there may be uh, some... Uh, misconception of what really happened. But when a hundred people come forward and all their stories are the same, they are trying to find compensation for the damages that they suffered throughout the years on being on these shows where um, they are um, alleging that they were in, in hostile environments that they weren't getting fed. They were being induced by alcohol. 
um, and they weren't protecting certain people. And there was some, I don't know, sexual things that were sexual misbehavior. That never yeah. happened on our show, the sexual misbehavior. But we had to beg for food. We're like, we're hungry. Okay, you guys will eat later. You have to film right now. Um, and uh, tons of alcohol. I mean, you, you bottles and bottles and bottles and bottles. And deprivation of sleep. They would not let us sleep. It didn't matter if I had my door locked and I was, if we were traveling as a group and we were staying in a house together and I had my door locked, mm -hmm. they had a key to my door and they would open the door and come in and film. And I'm laying there to be naked, clothes on, dead asleep, three in the morning, five in the morning, did not matter. If things were popping off in the rest of the house and my name came up, I had to be involved. Right. Imagine if you're dead asleep and you get woken up to a camera, you're like, oh shit, I have to be on. Right. Right. And it's just, and that just, that leads to exhaustion and you're not using your brain because you're, you're brain dead. You're sleeping. You're, you're tired. Mm -hmm. Now, but I'm curious, what if you jump on this bandwagon and the person that is like next to you that also is complaining about this stuff is somebody from like summer house or winter house where that whole show, I don't know if you've seen it. I really haven't, but I know the premise of it. And I know that a lot of them, you watch these two go in and sleep with each other and they're with five different people on the show. And that's kind of the premise of the show. What if these people are the same type of people saying that this is something they want to be a part of, that they want to jump on the team Bethany, um, you know, route. Do you believe that those people are in the same boat as someone like you or someone who's really been through something abusive? It's not for me to say, I don't know, you know, um, I'm sure, um, they're typecasted and they're people that have liberal views of, of sleeping with each other. I'm mm -hmm. sure of that. They're, none of them are coming in and being like super conservative, like Christians and Jews and saying, I will not sleep with anybody. And they get casted. They're obviously casted for a reason because they go through several questions before they get casted for these shows. Um, but that doesn't mean that because someone is promiscuous, that they could be mistreated or not given a safe, secure environment to work in to create a show. That's super important. Absolutely. You know, regardless, um, it, we just have to have decency for people, right? Mm -hmm. Because because a, because a 21 year old chick comes on a show and says, fuck it, I wanna have fun. And you know, this is my summer to live it up. And I just broke up with Johnny and I wanna sleep with everyone in this house. God bless her. That's her life, but that doesn't mean they could deprive her of food and, you know, shove alcohol down her throat, you know, to make her act a certain way. Yeah. If she isn't, is a normal state of mind and she decides that she wants to do these things, more power to her. I'm not judging her. Um, but that's not for the network to induce. And if they are, then they should be liable for it. Right. I and, think that's and pretty, not, yeah, that's it's important. Up, it's up to a jury to decide if this goes to that, that far, if, this person who's making these claims is telling the truth and if she has a case or not. Mm -hmm. right. It's not for us to judge or for Mark Garagos to judge. It's it's on the jury. And I think it won't even get to that point, though. Um, I think that, that Bravo, because they know, because they get all the raw footage, mm -hmm. they know exactly what happens and they've turned a blind eye to it and they've been able to capitalize it for years and years and years and years and years. And now there's a power in numbers, hundred people coming forward. They're going to settle and they're going to pay out big. And um, I think we're going to see a change in format of how these reality shows are, are filmed and produced. Um, and it's going to protect people like me who got started on a show who were going, who were down and out, thought this was an opportunity and decided to do whatever it takes to make a good show. So I have to ask you then, have you reached out to Mark Aragos or to Bethany to be part of this? I've, I've never spoken. I've spoken to Bethany, I think, just in passing throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've spoken to Mark Garagos. Um, I initially called him to speak to him regarding my DV case um, because when the police officer came into my house and told my fiance at the time that he never liked me and he would watch my show. That's bias, mm. right? 
you can't judge me because of who you think I am on a show, right? And then make false accusations against me. And then told her, don't look at me like this. I, I have a gold Rolex too. This is just my side gig, right? So I called Mark. And when I decided to come out of hiding, I called him. I was like, hey, man, um, just recently, I want to I want to go after this cop for civil, you know, for, for, for civil harassment because of what he did and the way he he treated me. Um, and that's when he told me, he's like, there's a statute of limitations that where these recordings will only last for six months and it's been longer than six months. You don't have really a case or else I would love to take it on. And then I was like, what's going on with this reality stuff? Um, and, you know, he's like, you should be a part of it. I know you. You have a bunch of fans in my office. I like you. I think you're a good dude. And the way they treated you wasn't cool. And we had a minute conversation about it. Um, and I'm a little torn whether I want to be a part of it or not. Um, but because I respect you and I think you're so adorable and you're like, you, you just, you knew exactly how to get me onto your show. I just wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about these things because I feel bad for future people that want to be on reality TV. Um, I get a lot of calls from people. Hey man, they want to do the show about me. What do you think? I was like, don't do it. Don't do it. And some people are like, oh, this guy's an asshole. He doesn't want me being on television because he wants all the clout. But in reality, I just, I want them to know what they're signing up for. And I'll sit down with them and I'll tell them, hey, this is what's going to happen. Um, so me being on the show with you um, is to just voice my reality and what happened in my life and with, with this case with Paulina and to warn future people who want to be on reality TV that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Will you ever do a reality show again if they form a union, if they have, if you're a little more protected? Um, I will not do another Shaws of Sunset formatted show where it's um, a lifestyle show. I would do more of like a business one where it would follow me and uh, my business in real estate with my, um, with my, with my CBD line. Um, with my public speaking, stuff like that, that, that resonates with me mm -hmm. and where I can make a difference in a world. Cause at the end of the day, um, I don't want to be an entertainer. I'm not a clown. I don't want you to watch TV and forget about your problems because you're watching the problems that the problems that I have. Right. I leave you inspired. I want to leave you better than I found you. And if I can't do that, then there's no point. I've already done that. Yeah. So just to be succinct, I just want to know what you think is the most misunderstood thing about you. Um, somehow, after the first few seasons, how they portrayed me to be this person that has anger issues. Now, I don't lead with anger. I'm very protective. I'm very passionate. Mm -hmm. I protect people I love. You are my friend. I just met you. But if someone tried to hurt you, I would protect you because that's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. It's a funny story that I, that I want to share with you. I was at the gym two weeks ago and this cute Indian girl walks up and I go, is that Shanti Garanathian? I went to school with her when I was in the fifth grade and I still remembered her face because it hasn't changed much. She walks up and she goes, Mike? I go, hey, Shanti? She goes, yeah. And she's walking up with a guy and she tells her husband, uh, whatever his name is, this is Mike Showhead. Mike Showhead has the biggest heart you'll ever see in your life. In the fifth grade, people used to pick on me. And Mike was one of the cool kids and he would protect me and the other people that, that, that were getting picked on. And I'll never forget that. We are 40, almost 45 years old, five years, fifth grade, you're what, 12, 11? All these years I have not seen her and she still remembered. And like a fucking weirdo, I started tearing at the gym and I hugged her. And I was like, that is the sweetest thing ever. And I'm so happy that you remember that about me. And her husband high-fived me. He's like, oh, that's really cool, man. I appreciate that. And shout out to Shanti Garnathian for really touching my heart because that's always the person I've been. I'm very protective. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, there was this misconception that I'm not that person. And I'm super soft on the inside. I'm a little too emotional sometimes. Mm -hmm.
Like I said before, I think, I think you just like to feel understood and that's what like gets yeah. to your heart. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, all right. So just quickly tell me, what is your relationship now like with Reza, Gigi and MJ? Uh, I have not talked to them in a long time. I'm not talking to them in a long time. We kind of drifted apart. Um, the show really took a toll on us. This last season was very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. um, I felt very ganged up on. I felt very betrayed. People did things behind the scene that hurt me. Um, but if they ever called me and needed a helping hand or um, if there's anything I can ever do for them, I would do it gladly mm -hmm. because I can't erase that love I had for them, even though we may not uh, be fond of each other at times. But amazing people um, when they want to be. And um, they can also, you know, be really cruel and, and, and not nice when they want to be too. So um, after 10 years of sharing that space together so intimately, um, we needed a break. So MJ reaches out once in a while. I, 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 I'm, I'm so proud of her. She's kicking ass. Her son is, is doing amazing. Um, she's still married. They're happy. Uh, I know Reza's crushing it. I was actually at his father's funeral um, when, his, when his dad passed away. Um, Gigi, I've not spoken to in, in a long time. Nima, I chat with every so often. Me and Shervin are very tight. Um, we're like the Persian Hans and Franz, you know? <laughs> them? Yes, I you remember. remember them. Like of course, them. yeah. Yeah, so, so when we hang out, everyone's like, are you guys brothers? We're like, no. Mm. Um, so we, we, we hang out and he's crushing it. So yeah, I've really lost touch with a lot of people in my life. The once once the, the situation happened with me and Paulina, I kind of became a recluse. Yeah. And um, I realized I have to go back to being a one-man show and really building myself up back and really becoming a person of integrity, a person who leads with kindness, a person who is empathetic and loving and really find myself. So I just went back into the lab and just worked on myself and, and, and now I'm slowly, you know, getting my head out of the shell and, and, and connecting with old friends again. And I have to ask, cause I'm sure a lot of ladies will be wondering what is your dating status at the moment? Um, since my breakup with Paulina, um, I dated a really incredible girl, um, super smart, sweetheart of a person, um, just all around amazing, but she could sense, she's like, you're here, but you're not present and I need you to be present. And, um, I couldn't lie to her. I, I, I wasn't mentally prepared to move on. I, I tried physically a few times and that was cool, but it didn't make me feel better about myself. So I stopped that. And then when I tried to be mentally involved with somebody, because I wasn't fully over Paulina, I just decided that she's right and we should stop talking. So I'm single, just working on myself. And I think when the time is right, the universe will put the right person in my life. A podcaster that lives in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Hair thinning impacts all of us. In fact, over half of us will experience hair thinning. It's not only common, it's normal. Join the thousands of people who are standing up for their strands by doing something about it with Nutrafol. Have you noticed that your hair isn't looking as healthy as it used to? I am. Maybe you're starting to see more of your scalp or you're self-conscious about thinning patches. It can be frustrating, but with Nutrafol, you don't have to just accept it. You can do something about it. Let me tell you something. I am someone who has sort of been known for my hair my entire life. But if you didn't know this by now, I have been wearing extensions for over 10 years. I'm so excited to try Nutrafol because I feel confident that I'm giving myself a chance to start growing my hair and be help and be doing something inside out for the healthiness of my hair. And the goal is to eventually not have to wear extensions. So I'm really excited to see what this does for me. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended growth supplement, clinically shown to improve hair growth, visible thickness, and strength. 
Nutrafol's physician-formulated hair growth supplements uses science-backed ingredients. Their drug-free, patented technology provides consistent, reliable results. Thinning hair is different for men and women. Nutrafol has multiple unique formulas to provide exactly what their body and hair needs to grow based on your biology, age, and other lifestyle factors. Go to Nutrafol.com to take their hair health wellness quiz, identify causes of your thinning hair, and Nutrafol will give you a personalized plan for better hair health throughout the whole body. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and metabolism through whole body health. And it works. In clinical studies, they're saying 72% of men saw more scalp coverage after taking Nutrafol's men hair growth supplement for six months. And 86% of women saw an improved hair growth after taking Nutrafol women's hair growth supplement for six months. Take the first steps to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code UNDERSTOOD. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com. Promo code understood. Um, all right. And tell people where they can find it. Like, uh, uh, no, I knew what you were saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want anyone to be jealous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, me too. <laughs> um, so where can people find you? What are you doing? Um, you know, what? tell us what, what you're doing right now with your life. So um, selling real estate, we're, we're one of the top five agents in the company. Our team is crushing it. I work with a girl named Victoria Cruz, who's just the sweetest, kindest person you could meet. And then she could be a fucking pit bull and she'll bite your head off. You know, so she's one of those girls where um, she's crushing it and we're working together. So it's Victoria Cruz Homes and Showhead Estates. We've teamed up and we're one of the top teams in uh, in the company called Equity Union, selling real estate. Mm -hmm. um, I have a CBD line. Wait, wait, before you talk about your CBD line, I'm just so curious in California, in the LA area, there are all these companies. There's like Mauricio's company. There's the Oppenheimer brothers. There's, you know, Matt and Josh, like how, how do you guys have enough places to sell? Are you guys running into each other? How does that all work? Yeah. The cream, you know, the cream rises to the top. Um, you know, Josh and Matt are two of my best friends. Um, the Altman brothers, they are incredible real estate agents. They're crushing it. Mm -hmm. um, the Oppenheimer group is what they're called. Not Oppenheimer brothers, by the way. Sorry. Shout out to them. <laughs> you know, um, those guys have some agents that, you know, the, the 80, 20 rule, you know, 80% don't do shit. 20 do. And yeah. the 20% are the ones who are running LA. And, um, luckily I'm, I'm part of that 20%. Some people may think, you know, they, they're like, Oh, it's because of the show okay, the show has been gone for two years. If you don't have hustle, if you're not out there knocking on doors and making calls and, and networking and meeting people, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much clout you have. People don't just call me out of the blue and say, hey, will you sell my home? Mm -hmm. right? So you have to just network. So there is in, well, there's a shortage of inventory, but there's also a shortage of people who really want to do the work. Yeah. Right? So the Altman brothers are always on. Yeah. They're my really dear friends. You know? Yeah, I've known them for years. They're the greatest guys. I'm great so guys. close with Matt. I just love him. Oh, Matt's Matt's the best. He's hilarious. So yeah, they you know they they work very hard. I work very hard, and um, you know we're out there competing for the business, and you know we win some, we lose some, and that's that's just how it works. But yeah, I think we have 600 agents in our office. Oh wow. Okay. Amongst 11 offices, yeah. So not all of them are doing anything. Some of them you know, work part-time. Some just want a license and they don't do anything. Yeah. Some, they're really crushing it. Right. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. And now tell me about your CBD line. <laughs> so so uh, I'm a huge um, advocate for psychedelics and mushrooms. Uh, I microdose daily. Do you Have you ever taken mushrooms? I have not. No? Oh my God. I'm so interested in it now that I did that podcast with um, Jay Godfrey a couple weeks ago about ketamine. Podcast, by the way. Great podcast. I loved it. I listened to it. You did an amazing job. Thank you. Yeah. People have this uh, misconception about psychedelics and how, you know, you do it to get high. But if you take it like medicine, 
Um, you know, it'll eradicate the use of Xanax and all these other over-the-counter man-made pills that are toxic for you. You know, this mm -hmm. stuff grows from the earth. If God didn't want you to have it, it wouldn't be here, right? And and he and it comes from Mother Nature. And um, so I'm a huge advocate for it. This is the line, by the way. This is our gummies. So we do we do wow. microdose gummies, and I take I take a gummy a day and. It takes the edge off and I love it. And um, I think it's going to be, it's already, um, it's not le It's not legal, but it's been decriminalized. So um, I think yeah. eventually what we're, we're going to see is that it's going to be, I think LSD and mushrooms are going to become legal here soon, just like marijuana has become. And people are going to really see the benefits and it's going to help a lot of people battling their depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, you know, and an array of other issues that people have. So um, I've been pushing for that, pushing for legislation to make the make psychedelics legal. And um, what else do I do? That's pretty much it. I just, I'm going to start a podcast, actually. I, I decided, yeah. Do you have a name for it? Um, we're working on a couple of names. I'm trying to, I'll let you know when I come up with it. Okay. People can DM you some suggestions. Mr. Understood. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Understood. You can, there we go. You can do What's it up? with me. <laughs> you can be my co-host. Oh, I'd love that. You cry. Yeah. So I wish you the best of luck. I'm so happy that you took the opportunity to come tell your story with me. Um, I think you know, you have explained yourself in a way that, um, anyone would be really interested to, you know, follow your path, would want to know your, um, your version of the story and really feel like they understand you now. Um, at least I do. And it's been an honor and a pleasure. And I wish you the best of luck. I can easily say I'm so happy that I came on and I chatted with you. You were awesome. You made me feel very comfortable. I appreciate that you gave me the platform to just tell my side of the story. Um, people are misunderstood and mm. that's just the way society is. And until I, I always tell people, if you don't hear it from my mouth and you don't see it with your eyes and hear it with your ears, don't believe it because anyone can make up anything about you. So I'm glad I'm here. This is a great platform for people to come on and not be misunderstood anymore. So I appreciate that you allowed me to do that. Absolutely. And a shout out to Mike Schnedeger, our friend in Las Vegas. If you guys ever go to Tao, you have to call him because he will help you get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the man. He, he yeah. runs that behemoth of a company. He sure does. Um, all right, Mike, take care. And uh, I wish uh, you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S -S, understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.